Good evening, everyone. Thank you to everybody who has joined today. My name is John Wilson. I am a biodiversity conservationist and a protected area specialist who has been heavily involved in the general environmental scene in Sri Lanka, um, and including uh, the issues with animals in captivity, especially animals that have originally or had traced their origins from the wild. I will be the moderator for, for today. It's a pleasure to see everybody here. Uh, Panchali, shall I go ahead? Or is there anything else that we need to say before we start? Yeah, shall we start? Uh, so good evening to everybody who has joined. Thank you. And uh, good evening from Sri Lanka. Uh, so I will kick off just with a brief introduction for, about the purpose of this uh, webinar. So the webinar is titled A Life in Chains in Paradise, and it concerns captive elephant welfare in Sri Lanka. Uh, the webinar itself is organized by the Rally for Animal Welfare and Rights. Um, which is basically an animal rights advocacy organization with a strong vision to create a world where all sentient beings have equal rights and autonomy. It was founded in 2019 and is registered as a nonprofit organization. Uh, briefly, its objectives at the moment are ending the captive elephant industry in Sri Lanka, working towards elevating conservation status of our wild elephant population and recognizing the sentient nature of animals and their rights through amendments to the Sri Lankan constitution. Um, so now let me introduce the panel of speakers uh, today. First up, we have Ms. Panchali Pannapitiya. She is the founder and executive director at Rare Sri Lanka, uh, a prominent figure in the Sri Lankan animal rights movement, recognized for the leading role she plays in the lobby against captivity of elephants in Sri Lanka. Uh, Panchali has been engaged in many, many different issues related to the plight of captive elephants, which for many, many years has also been quite a taboo subject in general society as well. Through Panchali's good work, she has exposed a number of cases related to horrific abuse inflicted upon captive elephants in Sri Lanka. Uh, Panchali has also worked towards creating awareness building campaigns and programs about elephants, both in captivity and in the wild, and even helped found the rare touring theater for elephants. Uh, Panchali attended Musius College in Colombo, and has a Bachelor of Science in Genetics, Microbiology and Biochemistry from Bangalore University. She's currently reading for her Master's in Environmental Science at the Open University of Sri Lanka. Next up, we have Ms. Sangeeta Ayer. She's the founder and executive director for Voice for Asian Elephant Society. Uh, Sangeeta is an Indian-born Canadian author, broadcast journalist, writer, biologist, and documentary filmmaker, who is well known for her advocacy on wildlife conservation, especially focused on captive and wild elephants. Uh, her controversial documentary film, Gods in Shackles, was actually based on the treatment of captive elephants in Kerala, in India, exposing their horrific treatment uh, through and by religious institutions. Sangeeta is the first woman to have made a documentary about captive elephants in Kerala, and the film was actually nominated at the United Nations General Assembly, featured at the International Film Festival of India, and has received many International Film Festival awards as well. Uh, Sangeeta is the founding executive director and president of Voice for Asian Elephants, as I mentioned earlier, which was founded in 2016. And with her committed team, she has done some very remarkable work to manage issues related to the human elephant conflict in India through a number of different projects, which we can potentially go into later. Her organization has also created safe shared spaces for people and elephants using science-based solutions and has helped work on helping wild elephants through advocacy and raising awareness about the quality of life facing many of the captive elephants in India. Next up, we have Mr. Steve Coyle, who's the founder of Elephant Care Unchained. Steve is actually a zoology graduate from the Michigan State University and has spent more than 35 years caring for animals and spent the last 21 years specializing in elephant care. Steve is now working as a leading captive elephant uh, expert in the world, specializing in training, uh, positive reinforcement, foot care for elephants in captivity, and designing facilities to support a healthier life and welfare for such captive elephants. Um, he started his career actually at the Phoenix Zoo in Arizona and subsequently left to establish Elephant Care, which he did so in July 2016. Uh, since then, Steve has helped hundreds of elephants across multiple countries across South and Southeastern Asia and has even graced us in Sri Lanka with his presence um, through an invitation from Rare in which he has reached out to 75% of the captive elephant owners in Sri Lanka to discuss such issues with them. At present, he's the only overseas expert that has been allowed to touch and care for the two sacred tuskers, 
that carry the sacred tooth relics. And he has, uh, and his work with them has actually ensured that their health has gone up significantly based on what he has done. He was endorsed and actually recommended by the Tame Elephant Owners Association. And he has even introduced a booklet on how to improve welfare of temple elephants in the Sinhalese language, which has subsequently been distributed to mahouts and elephant owners. And he has even been able to implement economical enrichment methods for tame elephants and for riding camps for the first time in Sri Lanka. Next up, we have Ms. Otara Gunawadana, who's the founder of Adele Embark, who we are in the Otara Foundation. So many of you know, know Otara very well. She has been involved in animal rights advocacy, conservation, community projects, and she has also been a model in her spare time. Um, through her life, Otar has been a voice for the voiceless and has, as many of you know, assisted in the rescue and rehabilitation of countless uh, street dogs in Sri Lanka. Otara graduated in biology at the Bowling Green State University in the United States. And subsequent to her return to Sri Lanka, she started Odell and after that founded Embark which right now is the primary domestic and feral dog welfare organization in Sri Lanka. At present, Otara is focusing on inspiring the younger generation to become animal welfare activists. And she is heavily responsible for ensuring that this trend has been successful through social media. And today also through the Otara Foundation, Otara continues to push for greater environmental protection, animal welfare, and through her work has touched thousands of lives. Otara is a role model for many people in Sri Lanka today who continuously inspires those around her, including those at Rare. And we would just like to personally thank Otara for everything that she has done over her long and illustrious career. Next up, we have Dr. Ravindranath Dabare, who is no stranger to the environmental and animal rights activists. He is an attorney at law who graduated from Sri Lanka Law College and has been practicing in the, in the legal sphere for 27 years, focusing on environmental litigation and public litigation. He has published books on environmental law and case law on environmental litigation, and is also an editor of the South Asia Law Journal. Dr. Darbury is a very passionate individual who has worked tirelessly to ensure that there are equal rights for the environment, while keeping in mind that justice needs to be prevalent for both people and the environment. Keeping this mission in mind, Dr. Dabre has provided leadership to the Center for Environmental Justice, where he also serves as the chairman, to promote ecological sustainability by supporting ecologically sound community activities. Also, as an attorney at law, he has appeared for over 350 environmental cases and is currently representing um, both wild and captive elephants in Sri Lanka in six separate court cases, including the very controversial regulations promulgated under the Flora and Fauna Protection Ordinance relating to so-called tamed elephant welfare and the subsequent issues pertaining to registration. And then finally, we have Mr. Rukshan Jayawardena, who is currently the director of the, Wild, uh, the Wilderness and Protected Areas Foundation. Rukshan, another very well-known individual in the overall environmental community, is a veteran conservationist and activist, famously known for his exceptional wildlife photographs in Sri Lanka. Rukshan, through his work in the Wilderness and Protected Areas Foundation, has served on the boards of many different organizations and has also led the Wildlife and Nature Protection Society, which is currently the third oldest nature protection society in the world and the first in Sri Lanka, in which he served at WMPS as its president from 2016 to 2018. Rukshan is also considered to be one of Sri Lanka's foremost leopard experts, and his knowledge on Sri Lankan wild animals is incomparable. The book for the leopard, A Tribute to the Sri Lankan Leopard, was co-authored by Rukshan, and he also, and several of the photos he contributed are also displayed in this book. Rukshan has always voiced his strong opinions against the captive elephant industry, and thus, through his advocacy, has contributed immensely to the ongoing struggle of captive elephants in Sri Lanka. So that is just a little bit about our distinguished panel. From there, I will first hand over to Panchali to kick off the inaugural session. Panchali, over to you. Yeah, so hi everyone. Um, so uh, I'm going to take you uh, through the captive elephant industry of Sri Lanka and try to explain how different it is from other countries and what the, what the issues we as activists face and the issues that elephants face. Right. 
So, uh, so first of all, let's look at the number of captive elephants in Sri Lanka. So um, there are 91 elephants in the zoo system. That is 73 in Pinamala Elephant Orphanage, five in the Dehivala Zoo, 13 in Ridhyagama Safari Park, including one African elephant. And there are uh, 38 elephant smuggling victims. You cannot really call them captive elephants because they have been uh, brought, captured from the wild. Uh, but then they are in this, they are either uh, under the government right now or uh, with some private party. Then we have around another 100 to um, 105 elephants that are working for Perahara and other work. Now, when you uh, consider the 91 elephants in the zoo system, their protection and the jurisdiction is very clear. So the, the zoological, National Zoological Department has to provide their protection. But when you consider these 100 to 105 elephants working for paraharas and other activities, the, the, the jurisdiction and protection is, very, uh, is not very clear. So now there are uh, 39 elephants that have been gifted from Pinaval Elephant Orphanage under the zoo department as gifts to temper. Their protection is at least clear. So if there is a problem with abuse of one of these 39 elephants, we know that we have to complain it to the zoo department. Uh, so whether and whether they take action and whether and the nature and the and the, the amount of action they take would of course uh, depend on uh, the director general at the time but but there is some law that we can uh, fight for protecting the elephants there then the biggest controversial issue right now is the 10 foreign elephants in sri lanka there is um, so these elephants have almost no protection because, because there have been some issues with an elephant from India and now I think the very famous elephant from Thailand and another very famous from elephant from Myanmar had a lot of issues. But then when we, when we complained it to the National Zoo Department, they say that this elephant is not registered under them, so they can't take action. And then um, when we complain to the Department of Wildlife Conservation, they say that they don't have jurisdiction over foreign elephants. So there is no party, no authority in Sri Lanka to take action against abuse of a foreign elephant right now. We do not accept the answer given by Department of Wildlife Conservation because they have filled the CITES documentation and they have brought this, they have been involved in bringing the uh, elephants to Sri Lanka. So that's a legal matter that we hope to uh, explore in the future. But right now, this is the answer that they give when, when we make complaints to them. So um, then uh, if you look at uh, Kaveri Raja, this is the Indian elephant. So uh, he was brought to Sri Lanka as a baby. Then this is his condition now, broken leg. So he can't, he is of no use to anyone now. He can't walk in a parahara. So he's just uh, tied there uh, in a bare land like this on concrete again. And this is, this is the condition he is in right now. But there is no authority that is taking uh, any action on this. So it's just animal rights activists shouting and there's, no one is coming forward to help him. Uh, then I think um, the Thai elephant uh, Muthuraja I think most of uh, now it's very famous that uh, this elephant was brought from Thailand and they in fact even thought that the elephant was going to the temple of the tooth but he ended up in a different temple and then he was abused so badly again uh, front leg broken bad very very uh, badly uh, damaged feet and then so many wounds and all on the body uh, luckily in this case the Thai uh, the Thai government took some action. Since the Department of Wildlife Conservation didn't take any action, Thailand government brought vets from Thailand to Sri Lanka to see the elephant. And finally now, he's under uh, the custody is under the Thai embassy and he is kept in the, the Hivala Zoo pending future, uh, whatever plans the 
embassy has. So um, other than that, we have uh, two elephants that were born in captivity. In, in, in our lifetime, only two elephants have been born in captivity in Sri Lanka. Then uh, the remainder of the elephants are, uh, were elephants that were auctioned by DWZ and the zoo department before the 1990s. These set of elephants are the oldest elephants. They are the most weakest. They need our help the most. But here also the DWZ or the zoo department doesn't step in because they say we have auctioned the elephants and we don't have jurisdiction. So here also when we advocate for elephants, when we try to help them, we face challenges there. So um, now let's have a look at who keeps elephants in captivity in Sri Lanka. This, when this, when you look at, when you understand who keeps it, elephants in captivity in Sri Lanka, then you can understand how difficult the job of advocating for elephants is in Sri Lanka. Now, earlier, I think in the ancient times, uh, Rukshan will talk about the history. So um, say about 100 or 200 years ago, the so-called high caste were the elephant owners. They were the land owners and they were the elephant owners. So. Uh, you know, they were using elephants for logging as well as uh, sending for cultural parades and all that. Um, so now why do people keep elephants? They, it's like having a Rolls Royce. So ele elephants are associated with high status and prestige in Sri Lanka. So um, uh, even for a temple, having an elephant is a prestigious thing. So, so if you have a tusker, then you are a, a slightly of a higher status than, a t than an elephant that just has a female elephant. So that is how uh, it's judged here. So it, it's all an ego, uh, ego uh, problem here. So then um, still there are a few high caste traditional owners who have traditional uh, elephant licenses. And then now there's this newly rich, a little slightly uneducated businessman they also now want to get into the status of these, uh, these uh, so-called high society uh, or like the high caste, sorry, not high society, the high caste. So they also want to, you know, have have a, um, have a elephant next, parked next to their very expensive vehicle. And then we even have, so the thing that makes it most difficult in Sri Lanka is that politicians are also very interested in captive elephant industry. Our ousted president, Gota Biraj uh, was suspected of uh, keeping an elephant, an illegal elephant in his custody. Even, uh, even, even uh, our ex-president, uh, Mahindra Raj Paksha's residence, you can see that there are two elephants and those two elephants are registered under his personal bodyguard. And even a, even a judge of, uh, or a magistrate was uh, suspected of illegal position of uh, elephants. So this is the nature and the complexity of uh, of the captive elephant industry in Sri Lanka. It, it, it you know it reaches very very much above. So um, now let's look at the cause for our captive elephant industry's existence. No one can deny that we are keeping captive elephants in captivity for Perahara. The root cause is Perahara, not just of the captive elephant industry, but of elephant smuggling as well, because it is this, uh, this demand for uh, elephants to be sending, uh, sent in Perahara is creating that demand for elephants. And, in, and then in turn, the elephant smuggling happens. And even taking your elephant in the Perahara is considered a prestige factor. So what's wrong with Perahara? Why is it so wrong? Well, I think the number one thing is that the elephants are dressed with synthetic silk and velvet. Even if it was natural, dresses are bad for elephants. Even their ears are covered, so they can't regulate their body temperature. And then with that, they are taken on hot tarmac. Either they are taken during the daytime, that is about 10% of the time, uh, but then most of the paraharas happen in the evening, in the night time, where the heat actually comes out of the tarmac, right? And then uh, 
Elephants are most scared of noise and fire. Now, traditionally, how are elephants chased when, when uh, wild elephants raid the village? People use noise and fire. And here in Perahara, you take the elephants through noise and fire. I mean, just imagine how much of conditioning or how much their spirit would have been crushed to uh, fear their mahu so much that they would actually go among the, the things that they fear the most, that's noise and fire. So, so it, it's just so, uh, it, it's horrifying to even imagine how much conditioning they would have gone, gone through. Um, and then, of course, there is crowds. If, if any of you have uh, gone to a Perahara in Sri Lanka, you know, the crowds can literally touch the elephants. You can just put your hand and touch the elephant. So, the, the, and then, so this is added pressure to the elephant, right? And then, um, most of the time, however much the captive elephant industry denies this, Elephants are given less food or keep kept starvation during the tenure of the Perahara. So, although a Perahara would go on for three or four hours, the preparation starts another three or four hours earlier. So until, you know, most of the elephants, because they want to re reduce the amount of urine, they want to reduce the amount of dung. So this is why they are kept starving. And then elephants normally rest in the night, right? I mean, they are supposed to rest in the night. I mean, it's because it's a very, uh, uh, it's very hot during daytime, but here elephants work in the night. And then, um, so I've just brought this video to show you uh, what an elephant, what an uh, Perahara looks like. So this is uh, from a very famous uh, Perahara. Uh, this is uh, at the beginning of the Perahara. So you can see slightly, uh, the crowd is slightly far. But then as the Perahara continues, the, the road becomes narrow and the people come uh, closer. See, see how that elephant is uh, stereotyping, but no one seems to care, no one seems to understand. And some people actually now in the captive elephant industry, they understand that uh, stereotyping is uh, not dancing, but still, um, you know, it, they don't like to uh, accept it. Then again, the traveling stress. Elephants. This I'm Charlie. Captain. Yeah, Sorry to I don't think your screen is being shared. I don't think everybody can see your screen. Oh, really? Yep. Okay. Yeah, now okay. Yeah, now we can see your screen, perfect. Yeah. Okay, sorry about that. So actually I think uh, I explained these numbers and also you don't really need to. This is uh, Kaveri Raja uh, from India. You can see, I mean, I don't have to explain to, to show you how bad it is for him. Uh, Right. I mean, this is his life 24 seven. He never moves from here. And people call this retirement in Sri Lanka. By the way, that elephant in the captive elephant industry is retirement because he, he can't be used for any more uh, pair of hairs. This is Muthuraja the Thai elephant. This was uh, taken at the zoo uh, just recently, about uh, two days ago. And you can also observe the, the nature of Sri Lankan zoo. This is the, the Hivala zoo. Uh, yeah, so this is the video of the Perahara that I was talking about. Um, uh, see how badly he's uh, stereotyping. The dancers are dancing, everybody's watching, everybody's happy. And they think, actually, they actually think that the elephant is very happy because they think elephant is dancing. And even if you try to teach them, it's, you know, it's, um, 
It's unbelievable, actually. Yeah, so, um, so then talking about coming back to Perahara, the traveling stress, that is these elephants live in different parts of the country, and then they travel mostly by truck uh, to these places. Then they change locations. Then they go and stay for two or three days. Then they come back. Sometimes they just go on the morning, morning of the Perahara. And they take part in the Perahara, finish two or three days there, and then they come back. So even Mahouts tell me that elephants don't sleep during Perahara because, because, you know, because the change of location and the stress, they don't. So there is no, no rest for them. And when they're not going in Perahara, they are 24 seven tied on concrete in a very small space in a temple, but even in with private owners, that is the case. Um, they are, they're tied from front as well as tied from back. Um, and then, uh, and then if, they, if they're not doing any other work on holidays, uh, elephants are kept at the entrances of Perharas, like, you know, for begging, uh, people go onto their bellies and collect, and they get paid for um, uh, for giving blessings. And then people take photos. And one of the Mahouts told me that his monk gives him a book, and he writes down how many belly rounds and how many photos they've taken, and that money also uh, goes to the temple. Uh, but then, um, so this is. Uh, People wonder why in Sri Lanka, elephants don't go a mock as much as in Kerala. Well, this is the reason for that. These two chaining, ch chaining techniques, they chain the back legs together so that they can hardly walk. You know, forget running, they can hardly walk. And then they take some, not always, but most of the cases, they uh, take a chain tied to the back leg they, they take a round over the uh, spine and they um, chain it to the front leg so that if the elephant starts to run, his spine gets uh, tightened and he can't run. So this is like a virtual cage that he, he because he can't move any, uh, any more than this, than the chain allows him. And then when you cover it with clothes, no one sees this amount, this amount of chaining. This is what, and that is what most of the public see. You rarely see, uh, you know, unless you go early uh, before a pair hair starts, you can see these things. And sometimes they even use these uh, hobbles or spike chains. Then um, the other reasons why elephants are kept in captivity, in Sri Lanka, we don't have a big tourism related uh, elephant tourism related captive elephant industry. I think the biggest is Pinnaval Elephant Orphanage. That's a different subject altogether. But we don't have that many um, camp uh, riding camps. We have only about um, uh, three in Kegol and about three in Sigiri Air, Sigiri Habrana and Kandalama. Uh, about four there, and so now. They have because of advocacy, and especially because of advocacy from um, hotels, um, we have to actually um, appreciate Kandanam Hotel. They don't send their guests to go on the howda. So, uh, and there are some ethical um, tourist companies as well, and 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 of course animal rights activists have um, advocated so much. And now the riding camps in Sri Lanka don't use the howda; they stopped it. I, and so they do, I mean, riding is bad anyway, but howda is like worse. So they have stopped using the howda, which is a positive thing. And then there are some other two or three cans that only allow bathing and walking with the elephants. And then um, in some instances, we have seen elephants used for towing vehicles um, and then logging. And also they're used for weddings and parties and stuff as uh, props. Um, then uh, we have the state, the Sri Lankan government, the police has one elephant. The army used to have um, an elephant mascot, but, uh, you know, together with Otara Rukshan and us, 
He advocated uh, heavily on the uh, when the army tried to take a new elephant last year, and we were successful in convincing the army not to continue this 70-year-old uh, practice of taking an elephant, uh, keeping an elephant in the army, which was a great victory to us, changing a culture. And then, so, the, so these state-owned elephants are taken in the independence parade and uh, welcoming for any guests. You know, even the, when the Pope came, the elephants uh, came to greet him. So, the, so, you know, there is no freedom given at all for our elephants. They don't get to move even a bit on their own. They're even washed forcefully. They're fed forcefully. They're scrubbed forcefully. They're not even allowed to wash themselves. And nutrition, they always get one or two types of fleas. That is uh, jack tree leaves on a good occasion. Otherwise, mostly palm leaves and sometimes with uh, palm barks and stuff. So other than that, they don't get anything else. They don't get grass or, uh, I mean, otherwise they'll get sweet stuff. Like they'll get uh, bananas or fruits, which is actually wrong for elephants. And then um, the, uh, it's, it's really bad that most of, the, most of the elephants, when they get sick or there is some issue, rather than going to a vet, they go and try to do home remedies. Maybe 50, 60 years ago, there must have been good native medicine doctors that would actually treat, treat elephants. But right now, the mahouts, uh, their, their knowledge is not so advanced that so, we saw Muthuraja being treated with these home remedies. And, and sadly, um, I have to say that even our veterinary care and the knowledge of our vets is not enough, not, not advanced compared to the vets in India or Thailand. It's sad to say this. I know um, our vets will not like me telling this, but, but this is a fact that I have to um, declare because, um, uh, you know, it's... It, they, and they, they, they don't have updated knowledge and they don't have the equipment. We don't even have a, an x-ray machine to, um, to x-ray an elephant's leg higher up. They can only, uh, they can only x-ray their ankles. So, you know, sometimes those machines are like, just, it's useless. Then, um, so when you think about the mahouts, the, most of the mahouts are less are paid less than hundred US dollars. It it could be even sometimes it's even fifty dollars. So they have a very very low standard of living, and their owners don't respect them, and um, they are just you know given like a little place to um, sleep near the elephant, and they are always living away from their families. Their wives and children live in the village, and the mahout is traveling with the elephant. So, so they are very unsatisfied, very, very uh, frustrated. Lot of uh, individuals, so you can't really expect them to treat the elephants well when they are being treated that way. And there are some good mahouts that actually care for their elephants, um, but when they try to say, um, when they try to say that this is wrong for the elephant, or um, you know, one of the there was an incident brought to me about two months ago. The Mahouts had said that we should not take this elephant in this Perahara because I fear that he will, he will come back into must. And, but the owner had said, no, we have to take him. So although the Mahout didn't want to take, then the Mahout was right. The elephant came into must two days after taking part in the Perahara. And that was the third time this elephant came into must for the year. So the mahout was actually feeling very bad for that elephant because during uh, during must chains are not taken off at all. They just chain the elephant, give some food, and let him be till their must period finishes. So, uh, and in that case, the mahout actually resigned because he said, you know, he's had it. And now, um, you know, in Navala, uh, this these are e the easier things to do when you look at them because. Um, you know, the government has the money, you have enough mahouts, you have like 73 elephants, you have one mahout each for all these elephants. But then there is no improvement. 
they still, Pinavala Elephant Orphanage, Behivala Zoo, and even Ridigam Safari Park still uses negative reinforcement. And Pinavala is now even trying to keep the uh, orphanage open at night because they wanted to cater to the hotels and the boutique owners. This, they're taking to this rocky river because the hotels and the boutique owners uh, can make money out of it. So they make the elephants cross the road and go to the river. They don't, what, what our uh, government authorities, uh, like the level authorities don't understand is, the more you interact with the elephant, the more you're, the, the, the lower the standard of welfare is going to be. If you let the elephants be, then, you know, very automatically the welfare improves. Then Pinaval is just 25 acres and there's 73 elephants. So it's, it's no way enough for these elephants. Um, so, you know, they say we are keeping elephants unchained and then they are chain free and then they show this picture, but it is complete deception. Uh, if you go to Pinavala after five o'clock, you can see the reality of Pinavala, where all the elephants are uh, stacked up in their concrete enclosures and chained up. Um, so, however much I think Otara tried um, very much uh, to, uh, with Hal Buckley, to make the, you know, she even made a plan, but the government did not take it. And we worked with Steve, we tried very much to uh, reach to Pinamal authorities, but they don't want to change. That's the, the bad attitudes and the egos. And there is a very big gap between the Vets and the Mahals. The, you know, the Vets are of a different class, the Mahals are of a different class, and they don't work together. There are two teams, they're not one team. So um, then, of course, uh, Pinaval Elephant Orphanage gifts elephants to temples. They breed elephants, then they gift them to temples, and then they send them to foreign zoos. So they use them till about five years to put a show up because pe to attract people with baby elephants. And then finally these elephants end up, most of them end up in temples and um, they are sent to foreign zoos. Like Carvan was an elephant gifted from Pinavala. Mali in the Philippines, always on concrete, all alone, is from Sri Lanka. Then there are elephants in Iran, Japan, and so on. And, and our authorities don't even follow up on them. They don't even know whether they are alive. So this is the I'm sorry, that... sorry, sorry to interrupt. If you could wrap up now so we can head on to the other speakers in the interest yeah, of... Yeah, I, I think I'll need about two, three minutes more. So this is a, a, like a video from uh, Pinavala. You can see how, uh, I mean, the elephants can get into the water by themselves, but look at this guy, how he's, uh, he's just making the elephants, hooking the elephant and getting the elephant in the water. This is highly unnecessary, right? So it's, it's just unbelievable why they do it. It's just very difficult to understand. So then, um, yeah, so, uh, so as I told you, elephant smuggling is a result of the captive elephant industry. It's a conservation welfare as well as an animal rights issue. Um, so these are the numbers of uh, elephant smuggling cases. Rohan Raja and Mihin Raja registered under the bodyguard of the ex-president, never had any court cases filed for them. Ganga of Ganga Ramya had a court case filed, but were never seized. Sanju, also somehow got away, uh, got away with it, but he also has suspicious origins. And then uh, the, about the 38 elephants, uh, Mr. Dabre will um, explain to you in depth. So about the welfare laws in Sri Lanka, there are no proper laws in Sri Lanka to ensure animal welfare of any animal, not even your own pet dog. So uh, we are still following the 1907 Prevention of Cruelty to Animals Ordinance. Um, and the animal welfare bill that has been drafted is delayed for 20 years and pending in the parliament right now. So they have introduced now a set of uh, very adverse regulations passed by the parliament as a regulation for tame elephant welfare and regularization of registration. Here in the FFPO, that is the main wildlife uh, law of Sri Lanka, commercial use of elephants is illegal. But here, they are recognizing the commercial use of elephants by mandating the howdah, which means they are recognizing riding, 
then they are recognized that they have given regulations for towing vehicles, which means that they're recognizing towing vehicles using elephants. And Terahara has been exempted from all animal welfare laws. Everywhere it says if it is required for Terahara, you can exempt. Then they have given a three months grace period for registering any illegal elephants in a country where there is a proper law to register elephants. So which means this is like, you know, inviting people to go to the jungle and catch elephants and come and register the elephants. Um, so Rhea is working on this five-year five-year plan, right? This is what we want from the government. We want the government to ban the usage of elephants for activities other than religious activity. Then limit usage of elephants to perharas of an identified list of temples, because every little temple in Sri Lanka is trying to take elephants in their perharas. Um, so this has to be stopped. If it is about culture, if it is about a tradition that has been coming from long time, then let only those very old temples use elephants for their perharas. Then limit the number of elephants that take part in perahara to 15 with a three backup. Uh, there is a reason for this. Um, then uh, if anybody wants to know, I can explain why 15. Then retire all perahara elephants above the age of 50 years. Stop breeding in Pindamala and Ridhyagama because they simply don't have the enough space to keep all these elephants and there is no reason why elephants need to be bred when we can very easily uh, conserve our elephants in the wild. Then we want either this 500 acres of Ridhigam Safari Park or allocate a similar space to make into an international level elephant sanctuary and transfer the Pinnamala elephants there. And if any uh, private owners can't take care of the elephants, they can retire them there and pass the welfare bill. So guys, um, so this is it from me. Um, thank you very much. I'm Panchali Panapiti from RARE. Thank you, Panchali, for that insightful uh, introduction to the captive elephant welfare issue in Sri Lanka. Very insightful and very detailed. Uh, next up, in the interest of time, I would like to invite uh, Otara, uh, to give her thoughts on the attitudes of people and how the younger generation is changing and how much hope she sees in this. Otara, over to you. You have 10 to 15 minutes allocated. You're muted at the moment. Oh, sorry. Um, hi, everyone. Thank you for inviting me um, on this panel. And it's a great pleasure to be here. Um, um, the, the animals, can you, you can see me, right? Yes, Otara, we can see you. Okay, all right. Suddenly everyone else disappeared. Okay, oh, I can see you now. <laughs> um, yeah, so um, 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 so I, I'll speak a bit about why, why I, I, I speak uh, on behalf of the elephants and all animals, and also why I think it's important that uh, we as humans start um, changing and making differences on behalf of, of the other sentient beings who live, uh, who live with us. Um, since Panchali um, um, spoke about uh, Pinnavala, I'd just like to, um, to just touch on that initially. Um, so she, she, what she mentioned was, right, I was actually trying um, three years ago with the government, working with the, the government and the, the minister at the time um, to, to bring in um, um, a, um, an expert, Carol Buckley, to unchain um, the elephants at Pinnavala. Um, and we actually went and, and met the officials and um, actually during that time, what, what I did notice, which she mentioned, uh, was that you know, the elephants there have, have, have no peace um, throughout the day, all the time. And the whole time we were there, um, they were being ordered on how they should behave, how they should act, how they should walk, where they should go. And even in the rivers, they're, they're not allowed um, to, to, to be themselves. You know, elephants, um, as we know, when we see them in the wild, and you, you observe them in, in the river, um, you see how, how playful they are, how, how they love rolling around, how they love splashing. Um, and if you observe what happens in Pindavada, you see that that doesn't happen. Um, the one thing is it's the river is too shallow and it's very rocky, so they can't lie down. They can't have their usual elephant life. Um, and basically then, I mean, right throughout, I just kept seeing, you know, them being ordered um, and the bull hook being pointed at them all the time. Um, so they really don't have um, the life of a free, 
um, elephant and the you know the life of freedom that they are meant to have in this sort of elephant sanctuary. So it is not really um, you know the the sanctuary and the place that everyone thinks it is um, for for elephants. I just saw a whole lot of um, uh, you know trauma and and pressure. Um, and you know it, it's very very sad um, to me what what I see um, in, in you know happening uh, there, um, which is also the same which I see um, you know in, in the zoo in the Devil Zoo. Um, so I you know what I would like to also say is that as a you know I've always loved animals um, from the time I can ever remember um, as a child, and I've always known that you know how how important it is. Um, for animals to um, to have their freedom, um, to be taken care of uh, by us humans, and to, for us to coexist um, with animals and to give them the love and freedom and happiness that they deserve, for, um, you know, on this earth and and especially in our country. Um, and um, so, from my childhood, I've always, um, you know, rescued animals, cared for animals. Um, however, as a child, I also um, was very brainwashed into, into believing um, many things about animals that were, were, of course, that we know today, uh, that most of us know today are very wrong. Um, and as a, as a teenager, I actually used to work in the Hevela Zoo together with Rukshan. Um, we spent a lot of time in the Hevela Zoo and at that age, uh, maybe from 15 to uh, 14, 15 to about 17, 18. Um, you know, I've, I worked in the zoo. I was very proud to, to be a part of the zoo, to help, you know, to take care of the animals. And, you know, I never realized what a life they had living in, in, um, in captivity. Um, the same way at that time, I never realized um, the life that um, elephants had um, on chains. Um, I've also been taken under, um, under the elephant's stomach for, for so-called good luck. Um, I was a ridden elephant when I was a child um, and, you know, all with great ignorance of not knowing uh, what these animals go through for us to have this sort of um, entertainment and fun in our lives, um, you know, um, at the expense of the loss of freedom and the suffering that these animals go through. Um, so, you know, over the years, um, of course, I was able to, I was lucky and fortunate to be able to understand and educate myself um, um, in a different way because we are all educated, but a lot of educated people still believe it's the right thing to keep uh, animals captive, to, to walk elephants in Perahara and to um, have them on chains. Um, but there is information, there is education, proper education available to know uh, and to understand how wrong it is for us to um, steal these animals um, from their life um, of freedom in the, in the wild, of freedom of, of living a life with their families, um, all for our benefit. A lot of it is for profit um, and um, a lot of it is for institutions of different forms where uh, people earn money off these animals and, and we as humans and as visitors, as, as um, you know, the citizens, we contribute um, to their suffering by paying to, to visit them in zoos, to go to a Perahara and watch them, um, to go to Pinnavala orphanage and, and support um, that cruelty that happens there and you know, many forms of, of animal cruelty. Um, and um, as you know, I don't just speak about elephants, I speak about captivity, um, for all animals and how wrong it is and how as humans we have to start understanding the need to change our ways um, to give these animals um, freedom and that also goes for, for dogs uh, as you know that's what I, a lot of the work I do and on a day-to-day -day basis I see dogs who are kept in cages for their whole lives and people there's such a huge disconnect and especially in Sri Lanka there's such a huge disconnect of understanding um, how wrong it is and how and to understand the life an animal leads um, to live their whole life um, in, a, in a cage to live their whole life on chains um, and to deprive them of their right of freedom and a life um, you know to a life which is natural to them um, and you know a simple way to understand uh, why it's wrong 
is to really uh, is to really put yourself in, in their position. It's it's the simplest way to to understand. And if we have any heart, and if we have any um, any empathy within us and compassion, it would be very easy to understand um, what these animals are going through. And if we would ever spend um, a week, a day, a, uh, even a week, even a month, the way an elephant lives on chains, it's a, um, you know, the whole time where it's ordered, he has no right, um, an elephant has no right to, um, to live its own life. He has to eat when it's ready when to eat, they have, they have, um, you know, they, they have to obey um, the human, the mahout and, and the human, the same way any other animal in captivity, monkeys in the zoo, um, you know, dogs in cages, it's, it's the same thing. Um, and, um, and, you know, once you start to realize how wrong that is, that's when you sort of start to want to speak out um, for them. And that's why I chose, I've chosen to do it um, a lot of the time, especially linked to elephants, you know, to, the, um, to a lot of um, hate that's, that's sent my way, which I don't take personally because I'm not doing this for... Uh, for any glory or personal gain for myself. I, I do it uh, because in the hope that at least there are some people who would actually see and understand, um, um, you know, the truth, the, 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 the real truth of, 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 um, of the situation um, and have a, have a heart and have a conscious um, to be able to, um, to understand and change their ways. And, you know, as, as humans, there's a lot of ego um, involved and a lot of, um, um, you know, from things that we have been taught and there's a lot of resistance to, to change. Um, and, but we also are gifted with the ability to, to become more conscious um, each day and to have the ability to, to change ourselves. And that to me is really, um, you know, how somebody is really valued and, and, the, and the ability of somebody to, to accept, my gosh, I, you know, I was so wrong all these years. And I now understand that, you know, that, um, you know, that I, I misunderstood um, the, you know, what, what I was taught and um, what I was taught was wrong. And, and we do have the ability to change. Um, and, and um, you know, so that's why I use my platforms. That's why I speak with the hope of more and more people understanding. And I must say, whilst I struggle with, with the amount of cruelty that I see each day in, in Sri Lanka and the inability to change a lot of the, the laws, the regulations, no matter how much I've tried with, um, with, um, with governments, with, people, with influence, with, with in many ways, in certain small things have, have, have changed. Uh, but I do see uh, a change in people. Uh, there is there is a shift um, that that has happened with more people understanding um, why it's important um, to, um, um, to to speak out, um, to comment, um, to make a difference um, in whatever way they can. And uh, and you know there are I mean there are benefits um, to to many animals' lives uh, that have happened as a result of it. You know, the greater change always happens when the greater portion of the population can change uh, and can understand, um, you know, what we have been doing is, is wrong. And that, of course, as we know, is not only linked to animals. There are many other things that we've always thought was, was right, but we've um, changed over the years because we realized uh, there were many reasons why those things were put in place, which are now wrong. And, uh, you know, they have, been, uh, they have been changed over the years. Um, so, um, so, you know, I, I do think um, um, the Hewilla Zoo is one of the most, sadly, one of the most cruel places that I've ever been to. Um, the cages, the life that a lot of those animals lead. And I speak of, of that zoo because I have a lot of experience um, over the years of, of being a part of it. Um, so, you know, I know uh, how the life the animals have. Um, and how they have been treated and, you know, over the, over the years and how it continues today in 2022, uh, we still deprive all these animals. And when I was there as a 17, you know, 16, 17 year old, there was this baby elephant, which Rupshan will remember as well, I know, uh, that was brought um, to the zoo from somewhere, stolen, or we don't know where the mother was, or, you know, and her name was Indy. Um, she must have been I don't know, one year or something. 
Uh, and then, you know, she was, and of course, at that time, I didn't realize, and it was very cute to play with the baby elephant and take care of her and all that. Um, but, you know, I left, of course, um, the zoo in, when I was about 18, and I, of course, went to university, got married, had children, and ran my business, you know, did lots of things. And, you know, you go to the zoo today, and she's still there right, on, on chains, um, you know, 30, 40 years later. She's still in the same place, um, in chains. Um, she used to have to dance and, you know, uh, before, but I think that has kind of been stopped and they use it now as some education or something slightly different, but it still happens in some form. Um, and also I think it's, you know, it's, it's important to understand um, the difference. I think there's a lot of disconnect um, with people under, you know, not understanding um, the, the difference between domestic and, and wild animals. And, you know, I always get this pushback about, you know, oh, you take your dog on a leash, and if, which I rarely do, actually, because my, my dogs are, um, um, are left uh, free. But, you know, you, I mean, it's quite a normal thing to take a dog on a leash. Oh, if you take a dog on a leash, what's wrong with it? And then you, you start, you advocate for not taking the elephant on a chain. I mean, the basic things we should understand uh, before you try to, um, to, to speak against, um, you know, someone who's speaking about, uh, anyone who's speaking against uh, captivity, captivity of wild animals is, is to understand that they're wild um, and how they're how they are made to obey human command is by their spirits being broken uh, in the most cruel fashion, in the most cruel and hurtful way of how they are you know, beaten, starved and so many other things are done so that their spirits are broken so that they can obey humans. Um, and um, I mean, that's, that's how wild animals of all forms of, uh, are trained to dance, are trained to, um, to obey. Uh, and in the case of elephants, they continue. Why do, they, why do there have to be bull hooks next to elephants? Why do they need it? If, if the elephant is, is loving what it's doing, why do you need to have a bull hook to stab the elephant and to inflict pain in their feet, in their most sensitive parts of their body? Um, if they love what they do and if they're having a great time. I mean, like it's, it's simple things that we have to start understanding and know why, why there's advocacy, you know, um, to change this. Uh, because we must start living in a world where, uh, where we actually care for, for, for animals and we actually make a difference and, and give them the love and freedom that they, they deserve. And, um, you know, especially in the Perihara, it's done it's done, it's a, it's a Buddhist um, um, ceremony. And, um, you know, as I said, I get a lot of, a lot of pushback and a lot of um, hate sent my way whenever I speak about, um, about um, you know, the elephants um, in, uh, in, in the Paraharas. I am a Buddhist, I was brought up a Buddhist, I'm still a Buddhist, um, but, uh, you know, I truly believe in, in, in empathy and in love and compassion. And um, and about and um, you know that these um, these animals did deserve that from the, um, have that that's what the philosophy is about you know and and but here we are I mean using these these elephants and expecting blessings and uh, from from these animals that are on chains and are forced to to perform forced to act and suffer in these in this clothing, which, which, which is, which um, they don't like to wear because especially on the ears, because that's where they get their, um, that's how they cool themselves. Um, and, you know, and there's uh, lately, I see so many videos of people dancing with these, with, you know, these um, elephants, which are stressed and, uh, you know, and people just don't understand that they're under such severe stress and we, we just don't understand their, their trauma. Uh, and the suffering that they go through and you know they're just having fun and in, in, in 2022 if we can't educate ourselves to to understand um, how these animals feel what they're going through because of us because of our doing um, you know something is wrong with us and we need to start understanding that and start making changes um, so I will continue to to speak for them as much as I can uh, and, you know, even if 10, 20, 100,000 people can, can learn something and, and um, change the lives for a few animals, then, um, then that's good. Uh, but, you know, there's a lot that um, we have to get more conscious. And I think it's, it's, uh, 
um, it's a change in consciousness that we need to really improve um, the world around us, the country around us. I truly believe that Sri Lanka is suffering because of the suffering that we cause to so many animals. Um, and, you know, I see it much more than I want to see it. Uh, it's a struggle for me to, um, uh, to, uh, to have it um, so much in, in my face sometimes because a lot of people send it my way to ask me to help. Um, so I see it on a day-to-day -day basis. And um, um, so, you know, like today I'm trying to release a dog that has been, um, the dog has bitten somebody five years ago and they have made a cement box and the dog has been in the cement box for five years, never allowed out. Um, so I'm trying to find a way to release that dog. Uh, but, you know, these are the things that, I mean, in 20, at, in this day and age that we can't understand is so wrong. And, uh, and you know, that we can't understand the feelings of another uh, being that, that needs the same things that we do and lives, needs a life uh, of freedom and happiness the same way we do. There is no difference. Um, so, um, you know, I hope... Um, uh, programs like this and uh, webinars like this will help um, to make a difference and please when you, if you understand I mean, once you know what's wrong use your platforms use your connections use them, uh, spread the message to as many people as you know uh, because it really does does help when you see it on on other platforms comment talk about it ask people to to understand what's wrong stop it and you know sadly I see a lot of um, international um, Facebook pages lately promoting our, um, you know, feeding of the wild elephant um, near Kataragama on that road and, and a few other and many other things like that. And it's, it's very sad that even globally, there's still a lot of um, sort of entertainment of animals that um, that people um, think is, is right and laugh about. Uh, but, you know, if you've uh, but change is happening and um, you know if together we, we can educate ourselves to know why it's wrong uh, there's a lot more that we can do together to um, to help um, these animals thank you Farah. thank you so much for your insightful words thank you for everything that you have strived to accomplish in all these many many years Clearly, we do have a lot to do going forward if we want to truly enhance domestic animal welfare in Sri Lanka, as well as examples of biodiversity in captivity as well. So there's a lot to be done, but it sounds like we do have hope. And I would like to thank you personally on behalf of Rare and everybody here for everything that has been done so far and what will go into the future as well. Thank you once again. Thank you. So next up, I would like to invite Sangeeta. Uh, to share her two videos and to briefly elaborate on captive elephant culture and advocacy in South Asia. Sangeeta, the floor is yours. You have 20 to 25 minutes allocated for you. Thank you so much. It's really good to be surrounded by people who genuinely care about animals and elephants. And um, I was listening to Panchali and uh, I think there's a lot of uh, uh, similarities between what is happening in India, in Kerala in particular, and what is happening in Sri Lanka, even the way the chains are wrapped around. It's no different in Sri Lanka as compared to Kerala. But I just wanted to also point out a few things that Otara was just mentioning. You know, she said the simplest way to understand is to put yourself in their shoes. The problem with that is they you know, humans have this attitude that we are so superior, right? There's this superiority, feeling of superiority. They don't want to even consider that, uh, that animals and us are the same. They have forgotten that and we are part of the animal kingdom. So when there's this combination of arrogance and ignorance, as Otara was so beautifully describing, then people just cannot put themselves in their shoes. They're simply unable to. And um, Otara also talked about shift is happening. And I see that happening through these kinds of communications and conversations. Sometimes I worry if the shift is happening fast enough, right? And we panic. And so thank you for those beautiful insights, Otara. I really enjoyed your con your speech. And um, Panchali, I really appreciated 
you know, all of the details that you provided about the elephants of Sri Lanka and good on you for launching this uh, conference uh, as a starter and there's still a long way to go. I'm also very proud of every participant in this and I know Steve Coyle, we have worked together uh, to benefit the elephants of Kerala to support them. So I'll talk a little bit about that. But to begin, I just want to give you a, a quick overview of the plight of elephants in Kerala. There are approximately 2,500 captive elephants all across India, and more than half of them are you know, being exploited by religious institutions, not just the temples, but also the churches and mosques. And the reason being is that there are so many temples that exploit elephants, and they're seeing the amount of donations being brought into the temples. And so the mosques and the churches are beginning to say, hey, I want to have a piece of that economic pie. And so they are also starting to use. So clearly, there's not a single Hindu or Buddhist or biblical scriptures or anything in Quran or in any religious scripture that says, if you use elephants and you glorify me, I am going to be happy. God doesn't say that. In fact, every single living being has been created by the same God for whom these elephants are being tortured. Can you imagine that God's own children, and we are also God's children, and we, if you really think about it, we are inflicting such tremendous pain and suffering on our own non-human brothers and sisters. That's the disconnect. And I know Tara also talked a lot about the disconnect, and she's absolutely right. This is where we need to really try and focus on and decide on you know, do you think that God is going to be happy? Religion and culture, both of these entities are being misinterpreted, misrepresented by a certain group of people who do nothing but mint money. They, you know, lease out these elephants in these festivals. And there is a broker in between. It's like, you know, when you do some kind of an insurance policy of a broker, you have an insurance company and you have the person, so you have the middleman. And this is what is happening in Kerala. You have a, uh, you know, a, a, an elephant owner and then you have a broker and you have the temples. This broker is gonna work out whatever is most beneficial to him. So he will negotiate with the owners, you negotiate with the temples. And of course, in the temples, you have a whole bunch of devotees who think, oh my God is gonna bless me if I sponsored this elephant. Actually, God is gonna curse you because whatever you are doing is inflicting such tremendous pain and suffering. And as Otara was talking about, she's been a target of attack, so have I been. And we women in particular, face these in patriarchal cultures and this is just in your face constantly especially after the release of my film gods and shackles i received death threats and there's this one individual whom i don't even want to name he thinks he's this culture's protector and he thinks we are all the enemy of the culture and these kinds of pathetic memes are being planted in the minds of people people need to really stop and understand that what they're doing to the planet and the elephants is going to return to haunt us. When you capture elephants from the wild, what you're doing is you're destroying the entire forest ecosystems because so many elephants within the forest ecosystems depend on the survival of elephants. And by you capturing these elephants, you are basically destroying the whole forest ecosystems. When you really think about it, forests have trees. Trees give us oxygen to breathe and take up the carbon dioxide we put into the atmosphere. So imagine you are destroying the very breath of life. Trees give you life. Elephants are the source. They, you know, they plant seeds across the forest floor when they walk for miles on end. And these seeds become trees and trees are a life-giving source. But I wanna share with you the pathetic plight of the elephants after they are captured in this uh, video, which is about uh, seven minutes long. And after that, I'll come back and I'll talk about um, elephant, um, uh, about elephant, um, the, the psychological impact that these elephants go through. And I will do that within one second. Uh, and just let me know if you can hear. 
if you can see the screen. Can you see the screen, everybody? Yes, we can see the screen, Sangeet. I have returned to Kerala, a lush and beautiful state on India's southwestern tip. Kerala is also where I was born. But this is no sentimental homecoming. I am on a mission, a mission to stop the brutal torture of these sensitive, intelligent creatures. The city of Trishur is the cultural hub of Kerala and the epicenter of the elephant entertainment industry. This is the dawn of the annual Trishur Puram festival. Thousands of people are arriving from across India and around the world. <laughs> Trishur Puram is by far the biggest festival of its kind. It runs non-stop, day and night, for two days. For a blind old bull named Tripaya Ramachandran, it means standing shackled all night in a makeshift temple known as the Pandal. He may be blind, but he's not deaf. <laughs> Elephants have very sensitive hearing and research shows that their feet and trunk can feel even the most subtle seismic vibrations. But there's nothing sensitive or subtle about the assault that's unleashed all around him. In the morning, the festival grounds look like a war zone. The temple roof looks like it's been hit with artillery fire. The highlight of the festival is the umbrella ceremony. I can't think of a single Hindu scripture that mentions waving umbrellas while standing on top of an elephant. In fact, all the holy books tell us to treat all creatures with respect and reverence. Elephant society is based on strong families. And just like in human families, the priority is protecting the young. This little baby wanders a bit too far from mom. So his aunt steps up and nudges him back in place. It's an almost human scene that you might see in any playground or park. Wild elephant conservation is an Indian success story. There are 50,000 wild Asian elephants on the planet and fully 60% of them, 30,000, live in India's jungles. And this is where they belong, wild and free, not shackled and enslaved. Guruji Padmanabhan embodies all of the suffering of captive elephants. As we approached him, I noticed first the colorful decorations that covered his shackles. 
Then I looked beyond these tawdry ornaments. His hind legs were covered in raw, bleeding wounds. His angry and arrogant owner and his mahout tried to block our camera. I'm filming the parade. They know what they're doing is wrong. This is Ramabhadran, and I noticed he was struggling to eat. It was a sad sight. I learned that his fumbling efforts to feed himself were because his trunk was partially paralyzed. Despite his pathetic condition, they don't even loosen his shackles. So he hobbles and limps along. Just watching him trying to scoop up water from the tank with his lifeless trunk was gut-wrenching. I was told that seven years earlier, a careless truck driver had slammed the door on his trunk. Ramabhadran is one of more than 700 captive elephants in Kerala whose welfare is being sacrificed for profit. I'm fighting for him and all the other captive elephants and will continue to give voice to these sentient beings until justice is done or until my last breath. So, um, so I'm just trying to, I'm just trying to stop sharing. And so that is the real, you know, situation in Kerala. And the problem is the um, Indian government has come up with this Wildlife Protection Act amendment, which has included the words religious purposes, which means elephants can be used in religious purposes, which makes our fight for these beautiful animals even more difficult. Initially, they had come up with the amendment saying live elephants. I mean, that was so ambiguous that the entire conservation community went berserk and they, we all wrote letters to the Indian government. And I had many, you know, uh, international organizations write to them and talk about the psychological impacts of captivity, et cetera. And so they then brought it down to religious purposes and anything else, but it is still ambiguous. What does anything else mean? So there are so many ambiguities, even in the Wildlife Protection Amendment 2022 that they are about to launch. So it has yet to be seen and we are still fighting. There are still organizations in India that have written to them and said, do not allow this thing to pass because it's going to really, really impact the um, lives of elephants and it's going to encourage the illegal wildlife trade, which is already rampant, illegal elephant trade, basically, especially the northeastern states like Arunachal Pradesh, Assam, Bihar. You know, these are the places where uh, capture of baby elephants are uh, rampant. And this is something that, um, you know, we have to continue to keep an eye on because it has nothing, nothing has yet been finalized, but they're very close to deciding on this. And we continue to use the social media as, uh, you know, Tara was talking, you know, please try and share everything you can, whatever you see when you, this is one amazing platform we have, right? The social media platforms. If you see something that's wrong, just speak out because each of us have the ability to do that. We all have cell phones. 
you know, you can take a photo, you can take a short video, post it on Facebook, name and shame those who are doing it. Even then, there are no guarantees that they'll stop, but we need to do our part. And so one of the things that um, I learned through this process of captive elephant situation is, you know, the psychological impact of keeping them in captivity. And I did a lot of research and I actually conducted an interview with a wonderful uh, psychologist called Dr. Jessica Bell Rosolo. I'm going to share that video. It's about seven minutes long as well. And after that, I'll wrap up with like just a short uh, conversation and letting people know what we are doing. Um, so let me just do that screen sharing again. Um, it's the name of the documentary is called uh, Prisoners for Life. And I was honored to receive the um, National Geographic uh, storytelling Award, which helped me produce this film. And I'm also proud National Geographic Explorer. So I thank them for that. So I'm just going to share this for you and let's just uh, play the film. This bull elephant is trying to break his chains and escape from his jail cell. Madhavan is among the 44 prisoners in this notorious concentration camp for elephants in the southern Indian state of Kerala. This place is called Punnatur Kota. Inside, mostly bull elephants are crammed into a small area, sort of an elephant factory farm. Thirteen of them are exploited in cultural festivals and temple rituals. Between 2014 and January 2020, at least 15 elephants in this facility had died from exhaustion, neglect and abuse. This elephant is trying to cope with the heat by spraying gutter water flowing from the bull who's being hosed down. It's 40 degrees Celsius today. No respite from the blistering sun. There's no water tank in the vicinity either. Desperate situations call for desperate measures. He tries to break his chain, but he can't. He's visibly traumatized. Dr. Jessica Bell Rosolo has studied wildlife crime and trans species psychology. Humans and elephants share the parts of the brain that are susceptible to trauma. So they share that role of attachment and shaping the right brain and then shaping those connections between the right prefrontal cortex and um, the limbic system. And what basically that means is that that individual's ability to regulate stress and emotion is compromised. So you see what's either called hypoarousal or the inability to respond adequately, which could manifest as depression or severe agoraphobia, fear of being with other members of your species. Or on the other hand, you can get hyperarousal, which means you have this hypervigilance. You see this when elephants charge with no provocation or in captivity when they flinch when someone goes near them even though there's no actual danger. They're expecting danger. Watch this elephant flinch as his handler approaches him. He's suddenly alert, but in a few seconds, he settles down, realizing that he won't be punished. In the wild, elephants wander across vast areas, 16 to 18 hours a day, feeding on as many as 400 plant species in order to meet their nutritional needs. But here, they are shackled in cruelly short chains day and night, forced to stand in their own urine and excrement. The ankles of most elephants are swollen and deformed from a lack of exercise. Occasionally, they get to walk a few steps and carry the palm branches. But other than that, they'll remain shackled here for the rest of their lives, bored out of their minds. You also see stereotyped behavior. So that's where an elephant is rocking back and forth like this repeatedly, biting their own trunk. Such behaviors are symptoms of post-traumatic stress disorder, or PTSD. It's caused by years of abuse, and it ruins the animal's ability to think. If the trauma persists, P 
PTSD can hinder brain development, as seen in almost all captive elephants. Dr. Rosolo says there are three deeper issues that cause PTSD. The first would be that deprivation of agency. So if that elephant is unable to make basic decisions about his or her life, who to mate with, when to have social interaction with another elephant, how long to stay with the mother, that could really impact the right brain development. Every movement is controlled. This long pole is used to enforce the so-called freeze position. If he moves too much, the pole will fall and he will be punished. This bull seems to have just given up on life. The trauma is such that the sense of self is impaired, so that that elephant doesn't even have a sense of themselves in, in relation to other elephants, in relation to their herd. Third way, again, could be if that normative social structure is ruptured on a larger scale. You see results of that just as you see in human cultures that have experienced trauma after trauma. Elephants have their own culture. They have social information. They pass through generations. They have those strong social bonds. And so their culture really becomes fragmented. Dr. Rosalo argues that elephants are autonomous by nature and they should be allowed to control their own lives. Elephants possess agency. It would really be, do they have freedom of movement? Do they have social freedom? Do they have the ability to make basic decisions about when to move or eat or, or mate. And that is really impaired when they're in a state of kind of persistent and unpredictable violence. Dr. Rosalo recommends a new approach that would afford elephants the freedom to govern themselves so their culture and society can flourish. Self-determination recognizes that animals other than humans need social structure to flourish and to be full beings. When we prevent elephants and other social animals from expressing their social needs, from touching other animals of their species, we're really depriving them of self-determination. But until the loopholes in the wildlife and animal welfare laws are amended and strictly enforced, there's little hope for elephants in this concentration camp. If left to the religious institutions, these captive elephants will perish while people cling to their cultural myths. What a stark paradox that India's cultural icon has been doomed to a lifetime of slavery. Reporting from Kerala, I'm Sangeeta Iyer. So I really wanted to share that video, and this is the first time I'm sharing, by the way. So I just thought it's really, really critical that we start discussing the challenges they face physically and psychologically, the trauma they go through. And I know my time is coming up, uh, so I'm just going to wrap up this conversation and just say I want to give hope because collaboration this kind of collaboration is so critical to bringing forth any changes and one of the people that I've worked with is Steve Coyle who's also one of the speakers and himself me and uh, Dr. Susan Mikoda we went to the same concentration camp we tried our best to make a difference the first day we went the second day they blocked us because they saw me filming and as a videographer what I was suggesting was let's do the filming of the before and after so we can show people the transformation that we are trying to make but they kicked us out so that went off the rail but then what happened is the Kerala State Department the Chief Wildlife Warden uh, Mr. Surendra Kumar he invited me and Stephen Coyle back again we went into some of the government-run elephant camps and we did make a difference in the lives of some elephants because one of the people there like he was so receptive of everything we were saying and I'm and I'm holding my hope because the new forest secretary of Kerala is more open to these kinds of ideas. So the, the, the moral of the story is if we don't collaborate, you know, we cannot make a difference. There's no need for competition between the nonprofit organizations and the activists. There's no need for criticism. There's no need for any of that. Just stop it. Just stop it. This is a critical time in our planet's history. If we all don't come together, we are all going to implode along with the planet. So let's get real, let's get serious, and let's make a difference. Spread the word, 
and just, you know, let's work together. Thank you so much for having me. Thank you, Sangeeta. That was very insightful and it's really indicative of just what a South Asian problem this is. It's not just restricted to Sri Lanka. It's clearly happening on mass in India. And there is a lot that needs to be done across trans country boundaries in order to address this issue overall. So extremely insightful. Thank you for all the hard work you put in. And we look forward to continuing collaboration with you on these matters. Thank you once again. All right, so up next, I would like to invite Ruksham for his segment, which will deal with the history of the captive elephant industry in Sri Lanka, including a few political components potentially as well. Ruksham, over to you. You have 15 to 20 minutes. Thank you, John. Uh, and thank you everyone for inviting me to be part of this webinar. Um, what I want to talk about is uh, the very beginnings of elephants in this island. Uh, this island, this elephants, uh, populated it from coming across from India, and uh, over the over the millennia, several land bridges connected northern Sri Lanka and southern India, and elephants have walked across these land bridges. Um, the last of these land bridges submerged about nine thousand years ago, but it's uh, safe to assume that land bridges that were connecting the two land masses earlier than that, more substantial and forested, would have been the conveyance for elephants from India to come to Sri Lanka. So it also uh, can be seen that the Sri Lankan elephant is a subspecies. It is, it is not the Indian elephant and therefore the separation of the two populations have been long enough for the subspecies to take place. Um, so early man uh, in Sri Lanka uh, is dated to about 45,000 years ago. And uh, elephants, however, have been here long before that. And we are really not sure what interactions early hunter-gatherers and elephants had, but uh, definitely there would have been um, problems, friction, and perhaps some hunting, but uh, by and large, the elephant population would have been allowed to live their lives in the forest um, in, in a greater freedom than they have to face later on. Um, in early historic times, um, there are records of elephants being taken into captivity. Um, there are records of uh, pre-Christian kings um, having war elephants, uh, especially in um, what is a uh, quite a popular historiography in Sri Lanka called the Mahavamsa, there is mention of uh, the king who um, dedicates the first city in this country. Um, or actually, it's a planned city. It's called Anuradhapura, and it is still there in more or less ruined state. Um, and uh, an elephant is used to break the ground to demarcate the cities, the citadel boundary limits. Um, so that is about 350 BC. And then subsequently, um, many uh, elephants are uh, held in captivity for war purposes. And there are many kings, you know, up to 100 kings probably ruled from these northern capitals. And uh, they had elephants um, for various purposes, uh, one being uh, war machines. Um, but we have to understand that elephants in ancient or 
uh, pre-industrial Sri Lanka or in the pre-industrial world was basically used as a piece of machinery. Uh, they were the chainsaws, the heavy lift, the earth movers, the heavy haulage trucks, uh, and, and the steam rollers of the ancient world. So they they were all all that rolled into one, and latterly um, we have machines to do every one of those tasks. So uh, we really don't um, need a traction animal or animal with a strength or versatility like an elephant to do any of those tasks. So uh, why ancient people? or pre-industrial people have kept elephants in captivity has very different reasons and different connotations to why people keep elephants in captivity today. So many of the justifications you could make for having elephants in captivity no longer exist. Um, elephants were captured from the wild in Portuguese times. So if we fast track to the time of colonial expansion into the Indian Ocean, uh, the Portuguese uh, land on Sri Lanka's coast first, and the Portuguese do some capturing of elephants. They use the kraal method, as the Dutch do later, um, or the what we call the Keda system. Um, they also lasso elephants within either confined space that they are driven into, um, and uh, they are exported. But the real large scale export of elephants uh, due, uh, is done during Dutch times. And uh, the Dutch export elephants mainly to other parts of Asia, and especially to India. And the Dutch had a belief that um, Asian, the Ceylon elephant or the Sri Lankan elephant was superior. The elephants from this island were superior to Indian elephants. So, in fact, they found, had a marketplace in India for elephants from this island. Um, elephants um, were also captured during British times, but much more than capture, the British had decided that the elephant was an animal that needed to be exterminated. So they paid five shillings per tail of uh, each elephant that was brought, elephant tail that was brought to a government office or what we call locally Khachari. And so that was the incentive to kill elephants. And many um, British residents living in this island uh, shot elephants uh, as they made a sport out of it. And uh, the government uh, constantly said that uh, for agriculture and for people to live uh, peacefully in the island, the elephant has to be exterminated. So three individuals in particular um, uh, go down in history for killing the largest number of elephants uh, in Sri Lanka. Uh, uh, Captain Rogers uh, killed 700. Um, sorry, Major Rogers killed 700. Captain Galloway uh, killed 650, and uh, Sir Samuel Baker killed 600. These are individual kills for elephants in uh, limited stays in the island. But somehow during British times, this relationship changes, and the British decide that uh, a certain amount of, I mean, perhaps they also decide that it's futile to try to exterminate all the elephants. And uh, there's also some uh, area set aside for sportsmen, uh, hunters, and where elephants get some degree of protection, or at least there is a permit system to kill elephants, or that they have to be declared as rogues before they can be shot. But blanket protection for the elephant doesn't come till long after independence uh, in 
the 1950s. Um, and uh, however, the relationship uh, between humans and elephants doesn't dramatically improve because uh, human-elephant conflict is something that starts burgeoning and growing. And uh, elephants are, are not captured. I mean, there is, there is a moratorium on capturing elephants and elephants are allowed to live uh, their lives uh, within the forested areas that they do live in. Uh, and they are protected, whether they be in protected lands, uh, in other words, sanctuaries, national parks, reserves, or whether they are outside of those lands. But outside of those lands, then there is a lot of conflict with farming communities. And human elephant conflict in Sri Lanka is uh, created by humans. In other words, it's often lack of political will or bad political decisions, putting humans in harm's way or in the path of elephants. And uh, however, elephants are used for pageantry through time. Um, it's hard to uh, exact say when the um, Temple of the Tooth or the uh, the Perahara that is held every August in Kandy uh, began with elephants, but it is there's some record that uh, that uh, spectacle and that pageant uh, transpired before uh, you know for some centuries uh, without elephants, and then elephants were added. But I have also seen uh, um, a frieze in an ancient temple where uh, there is a procession of elephants and people, and some of the people are riding on the backs of elephants. But there is no indication as to what that procession was. Um, elephants so, are uh, intertwined with the culture of this country. Um, you see elephants in the freezers of uh, temple uh, or stupas. Um, and uh, it's a common motif uh, in uh, many ancient temples. And both, uh, and there is indication that they're always captive elephants because either they have a, a rope around an anchor or uh, some other rope over the shoulders or some indication that the, animal is actually a captive animal. Um, but the justification for captivity um, no longer exists. Uh, and uh, the laws do protect elephants in the wild, but uh, in very recent times, uh, elephant smuggling or uh, illegal industry capturing elephants from the wild has begun. And that is something that is uh, very disturbing to conservationists, to animal welfare activists, and uh, anybody who cares for these animals and would like to see them continue to live a peaceful existence or coexistence in the wild. Um, the animals, that have been captured have been captured sometimes at cost to their mother's lives. And uh, there is, um, this has gone on for maybe up to 15 to 20 years now. And uh, many people have fought to try to put a stop to it. But as Panchali mentioned earlier, there is, a, there is prestige involved in elephant ownership. And there is uh, politicians have involvement with elephant ownership. Um, there is, uh, it's almost like when, when you own everything you ever want to, and you have vehicles and houses and um, every other uh, comfort, 
um, the next step is to own an elephant. I mean, it's not everybody who thinks like that, but unfortunately, some people do think like that, and uh, they don't really care how they obtain these elephants. And this is what um, you know, upcoming court cases are all about: trying to bring some semblance of normalcy to this illegal trade. So, um, uh, just to recap, Sri Lanka has always been a country or an island which has exported elephants uh, from many ports, from ancient ports, from ancient times up to modern times. And we still do send elephants out of the country. Um, there have been attempts to stop this, um, but somehow each government that comes in uh, allows some loophole to be used to send elephants as exchange gifts or gifts from the people of Sri Lanka or whatever uh, to various nations. And uh, many of these animals live abject lives uh, in their host countries. Um, so I, I have, uh, don't have a lot more to say. I don't have anything visual to uh, present today, but uh, just wanted to give you an overview of uh, how the elephant in, in its context in Sri Lanka um, and uh, the fact that I, something that I always stress is that the elephants were here first, not us. So we have every uh, need and uh, elephants have every right to coexist with us and we should accommodate uh, that right that elephants have whether uh, these rights are uh, like human rights universally acknowledged or not they are rights and uh, humans always uh, lay claim to land or lay claim to privileges or access or um, um, or well, they assert their rights based on who was there first. So based on that basis, elephants were here first, long before us, long before prehistoric humans. So um, that should be acknowledged. Thank you. Thank you, Rukshan. It's, it's been said that without truly understanding our historical mistakes, we can never really move forward as a holistic society. And I think through your segment, we've really come to understand that. And now more than ever, um, administrative, good administrative decisions in protected area management, scientifically driven biodiversity conservation efforts and changing attitudes of people towards animals in captivity, animals, um, whether they're biodiversity or domestic, which many people see almost as having been domesticized. I think all of that needs to seriously change going forward. And it's really wonderful that you were able to elaborate on the historical context as well. So thank you very much once again. So next up, I would like to invite Steve to give his insight into animal welfare situations, his experiences with the Mahouts in the captive elephant industry, and maybe a few suggestions on how Sri Lanka can improve overall welfare for captive elephants, how to make their everyday lives, which are clearly not uh, thought of on a regular basis better. Over to you, Steve. You have 15 to 20 minutes. Thank you for uh, having me. Thanks, everybody, for inviting me. Let me just get this set up here. Can you guys see that okay? Yeah. Yes, you can see Steve. Okay. Yeah. Okay, good. Let me uh, make it big. Um, yeah, I was asked today to speak a little bit about my experiences um, with the captive elephants in Sri Lanka. Um, you guys have all talked about a lot of the situations and a lot of the issues, uh, but I'll kind of give you guys a visual uh, perspective as to what's actually going on um, and everything that I'm going to share. Let me just change the screen. Um, everything that I'm going to share with you guys is, um, is, is Sri Lanka, it involves Sri Lanka. So um, a little bit about me. Uh, that, that's my, you guys already mentioned that earlier. Um, I have a nonprofit. So I travel around, uh, I've got projects in six countries, you can see in the bottom there. And I do have a degree in zoology. I don't know if that matters or not. Um, 
But basically, uh, I'm going to talk about my, my recent trip to Sri Lanka. And you can see I visited from September of two, uh, 2021 to April. This thing is in my way. Let me move this thing. Um, from April of 2022. In that time, uh, 39 elephants I was able to treat. Um, what's also more important than that, it, it allows 39 opportunities to um, share knowledge, uh, to plant seeds is what I call it. Um, and with that, I mean um, the issues that I see with these feet and if, if elephants have good feet, they have a good environment. Yeah, so it's very important to take care of their feet. Um, and we'll talk a lot about that now. Um, I saw 75% of all the captive elephants, uh, all three of the zoos, we'll call them zoos, and then spent all of my time in the, uh, um, I guess the private sector, the temples, and you guys all talked about these temples and, and the private uh, owners. And then uh, also handed out 200 basic elephant care booklets, which is the cover is down there, you guys see. Um, and I also wanna point out that these five elephants that we're looking at um, are kind of giving me some hope. Um, they had good mahouts, uh, understanding, we had good dialogue. Um, they, were, they were well looked after for the most part. Um, so it kind of gives me some hope. These are the five of, of all the elephants that I saw that kind of stuck out um, and I was able to help them a little bit. Um, so yeah, so uh, let's see here. So basically, this is how the captive elephant is kept in Sri Lanka. They're chained in the same spot, usually on concrete or in the water, both not good for long periods of time, uh, especially being in the water for long periods of time is not good. Um, chained on the front and back, you know, every elephant, every captive elephant in Sri Lanka is kept this way. You guys all know this, yeah? So again, not good. There's no benefit to being a captive elephant. There's no benefit to them being a captive elephant uh, in, in Sri Lanka, yeah? So they're all the same, uh, but I think what's a good thing to point out, not, not a good thing, it's, it's something I'm pointing out is that they basically live in their toilet, okay? So these elephants are chained to the same spot, they go to the bathroom, um, they stand in their own fecal matter, they, they, stand, they urine, they pee on themselves. Um, and regardless of how much you clean it, the urine is always there, um, and that creates a lot of problems uh, for them. Uh, urine burn, they get urine burn. Basically urine burn, there's this track. I don't know if you guys can see my little pointer. There's a track on the inside of the back foot there. Um, this urine basically eats away at their skin because they can't, they can't get away from their own excrement, yeah? So like I said, all these pictures are all Sri Lanka. These are all Sri Lankan elephants during, during my trip. Um, we get pads being on concrete. Um, of being on improper substrate. Um, you have thin pads. The, the three, these three top pictures are th real thin pads, obviously, and standing on concrete. It's basically just wearing your skin down. Um, again, not good for the elephant. Uh, you got pad separation down here in the bottom. That's from being elephants when they stand on uh, soft debris, meaning they're old food, most likely, and that becomes damp, moist. The pad can't wear normally, and it creates a lot of pad separation, yeah? Other issues we have, if you notice the top picture there, is two, this is side by side. Um, on the right there, you can see how the nails are worn. And I put my file there to demonstrate that's from concrete. So nail wears on, lays on concrete, the concrete sits there. And it literally, so the bottom leg now has that wear mark. Um, and so those nails wear down, they crack, they split because they're, on, they're in an improper environment, which means they don't have a healthy environment, right? Other issues we see, um, cracked nails, abscessed feet, um, all, again, all Sri Lankan situations, different places that we're not doing what we need to be doing for these elephants. Um, and the proof is in the pictures, right? Um, and so uh, we get abscesses. We get two, at least the, the, the two pictures on the right, there are some very bad abscesses. But what I wanna point out to you guys, kind of give you an idea of what an abscess is kind of how it forms. If you look in this, third, this second picture here, there's a little spot right there. That's actually a bruise starting to form. And that's from rocking and swaying. Uh, it builds up pressure. So the foot bruises on the inside. And over time, you get these huge eruptions. There, there, there. So yeah, so that, that's bad. It's again, because they're in the improper environment is why these problems happen. Um, why we keep them in the improper environment? So that we can do this, right? So you guys talked about this. This is not my fight. This is not a Westerner's fight. 
Um, I always say this, no matter what country I go to, um, until the demand changes, things won't change for these captive elephants, regardless of the country that we're in, right? But obviously this is the Parahara. We keep them on display or for our entertainment in, in proper environments so we can do these things, right? Not good for the elephant. Regardless of who I talk to or where I go in the world, the elephant story is always the same. I'll never suggest something that's bad for the elephant, right? So, um, so what do we do? So my talk will be pretty quick. So here's kind of a case study about um, what can be done currently for uh, Sri Lankan elephant. So this is a temple elephant. Um, and I was very fortunate. That. And I need to say thanks to everybody involved. Um, both sides of the both sides of the fence, um, you know. Ultimately, caring for elephants is what um, was what I'm about, um, and so uh, thanks to the people that allowed me to care for their elephants, in a sense, because they, they, it takes a lot to to trust, you know, a funny looking guy from the west um, to, to 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 do that. And so this is a, just a short little video clip. I'm not going to play all these videos. I'm almost done because I know time is, we're pressed for time, but this is a typical captive elephant uh, in Sri Lanka, yeah? And he's kept like this, obviously. Um, again, not the worst I've seen. He has some very kind mahuts, but this is his life. Okay, this is his life. Nothing to do, he has to wait for the mahuts to come and throw him food, very boring, terrible, right? Okay, so this elephant, He's kept like this because we got to do this. This is a video, but I don't know if you guys, it's the same elephant there at the Parahara. So he's in the Parahara, it's treated uh, a certain way so that he can do this. Well, what else can we do for this? Because this is, I think, kind of the, um, what's the word I'm looking for? This is kind of the, uh, the point of, of, of my talk is kind of a, doing what we can do for them right now and allow uh, the cultures, the, the ideas uh, to change for the betterment of all ele uh, elephants. I know Otara mentioned, Otara mentioned all, the uh, all animals, uh, but in this case, we're talking about elephants. So how do we, we change this culture, right? So, I mean, the video can play, but it's, you guys know how it is. But anyway, so what can we do? How can we help these elephants, right? Because the, the, the pear hair is not going to stop tomorrow. Or anytime soon, maybe, maybe never. You know, I can. Uh, the, and the thing about pear hair is for for the western. The pear hair is an amazing thing. It just gets spoiled by the elephants. The elephants aren't needed for the pear hair, in, in my opinion, from an outside guy. So, what do we do? So we do some footwork. Same elephant. I'll just play again. This is a allows me the opportunity to explain what we're looking at, why problems are with the feet, why you know we should move them from this current environment because they've got. Um, situations they've got issues that, that that over time happen current issues um, again this guy wasn't um, the worst I've seen um, and again they were very kind but they, they, they allowed me to, to, to do these things and these mahouts were very open um, and what I've realized is that a lot of these younger mahouts are, are open um, to uh, doing things differently you know and these guys are put into a very dangerous spot um, all for you know to make very little money and so um, if you make the elephant's life a little bit better, maybe their um, maybe the elephant will become less uh, stressed as, 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 as you know if it's in its environment. And what I mean by that is we do enrichment, right? So this is what we're looking at. Let me just mute it. We don't need to hear it. Um, what we're looking at here is actually kind of embarrassing. This is a very common thing in the West, right? Uh, very, very common is what we call enrichment. And so now, I mean, his life still sucks. He's still chained to the floor, front and back leg chains. But mentally, his life got a little bit better. He's sorting out in his head how to eat this food, right? He's a, he's a very fast eater, eats a lot quickly. Uh, but if we can increase the amount of time that they spend eating, like they would do in the wild, um, then um, his life wouldn't be so miserable. You know, and ideally, I like to hang the food up, which you see that picture in the corner there. Uh, we, we were hanging food, but those, those, those columns are concrete, and he was actually cracking those columns, and so we did this. And again, this is a very basic elementary thing, but also what's important is that this is the first time a temple elephant 
in Sri Lanka had ever gotten enrichment. It's actually, the more I thought about the first time any temple elephant anywhere in the world. So it's embarrassing that it's taken so long, but it's also a good thing because it can happen. Yeah, it can happen and see. So uh, it's a little bit of an investment. I, I purchased all these things. So I didn't ask the temple to do anything. I spent a lot of money in Sri Lanka, traveling around with the booklets, the enrichment feeders, um, different things that, that, I, that I paid for. So nobody's paying me to do this. This all comes from, 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 my, own, from my own pocket. Um, and so his life got a little bit better, right? So these are things that we can do immediately. And then I'm just going to close, I think, with this video here. Oh, no, no, there is hope. I thought I had an extra one. Okay, there is hope. So we did uh, seven elephants total. We've got some riding. The, the, one, the elephants that are reaching up are, are two riding elephants uh, to address that issue. So their lives, instead of standing chained to the tree waiting for somebody to show up, we can hang food and they can start working and, and keep their mind busy. The monotony of that. You got other temple elephants and whether... The temples are still using it or they're still using the, the feeders. Any of these elephants are still using it. They can. And, and, and I know that we, we gave those elephants a, some, um, what's, we gave them a little bit of, of hope, a little bit of stress-free uh, environments and the times that we were there spending time with them. Um, so that makes me feel good. And whether or not they keep using them or even use them after that day that we left, I don't know. I know that a couple of places are, um, but the possibility is there. The other pictures are is the booklet that I handed out. Um, and that booklet's basically kind of just a picture book with information, just you know, to, to 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 show things that that could be done differently um, that that benefit the elephant. You know, and, and like I said, I never share or, or tell anything that's going to be bad for the elephant. Yeah. So whatever situation they're in, we can we can do more for them. We we can get. We can do more. They deserve more. They, they deserve a chance. Um, and so um, with that, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to end with this video. It's like three or four minutes. I'm just going to play it. Um, I think I muted it. This is one elephant in Sri Lanka, uh, one of the last ones that were spent. And in his life, um, he has, he's on one long leg chain in the back of, back of, backyard of somebody's house, I guess. He's a, and you can see he, he doesn't care about anything. He just wants to be an elephant. He wants to do elephant things. And you'll see throughout this video that these are all, these are what captive elephants, this is, I'm sorry, these are what elephants do. And the way they're kept in Sri Lanka, we've taken every single biological need um, from them, keeping them on concrete, uh, keeping them on improper environments, not allowing them to move, to dig, to scratch, to dust. And he's going to do all of these things. And this is in a matter of about a half hour. Um, that I spent there. So this gives me hope. Um, you know, what he does after he leaves here, I don't, I don't know. Uh, and I, I don't really support that, but um, we, we can do better. Uh, we can do more and we should do more. Um, and so, yeah, you just watch this little video. It's kind of a, a neat little clip here, I think. Just doing elephant things. He's not looking to smash anybody. He could care less. You know, the stress is, immediately relaxed, his ears are flapping, he's, he's calm, he's relaxed, he's eating, he doesn't care, doesn't care if anybody's there or not, he's just doing what elephants do, yeah, and so we give him, the, we give him, yeah, so these are things that we, you know, the, the enrichment is what we try to do this artificially, but if you put him in an environment where enrichment's not needed, well, then here, there you go, again, the one thing elephants do is dig and they dust, right? They cover them skin. They don't need to be scrubbed for three, four hours, six hours, whatever you guys, this new law that they, whatever the thing is about putting it, keeping them in the water for hours on end, take them to the water, let them drink, let them do their own thing. And you can see he's very self-sufficient. They let, they, they let you know exactly what they need and what they want, you know? So he's dusting, he's having a ball. He's protecting his skin. You know, we, we, we scrub them and we keep them clean. And we, you know, we wash our car and we put it back in the garage. We take our car out, we wash our car, put it back in the garage. Really has nothing to do with the elephant at all. You know, the way elephants are kept in Sri Lanka, you know, that's what we did 20 years ago. You know, that's not what we do anymore. And you, what you're looking at now is what, how we need to care for elephants. We kind of just let them be elephants, yeah? 
Um, and he just has that one chain and, and it's tied it's tied in front of him somewhere. I don't it was it was a long chain. Um, and obviously you have to work within your constraints of, of where you're at, but this can be done. Again, he doesn't care. We're just sitting there hanging out, talking, hanging out, whatever. He's just doing what he does. You know, picking, browsing. You know, elephants eat about 200 to 300 different species of plants in their day. And in Sri Lanka, they're fed two, right? So, um, again, more things to think about. You know, so... He's a very happy elephant. He's just very calm. He's very relaxed. But he doesn't give a crap about us at all. Yeah. And just watching him do this, if we can emulate that where they're kept in captivity, that's a start. They give you the blueprint of what we need to do. Yeah. He's done all the things. He's scratched. He's eat. He dusts. You know, if he takes, a, if he goes to the bathroom, he doesn't have to stand in it. He can walk away from it. He won't just stand in it for the next 12, 16, 18 hours a day. Right. So, yeah, so that's it. I think that's all that I have. Um, just to kind of sum up everything, I guess. Um, and give everybody an idea. Um, of kind of my experiences. And like I said, those were all, uh, everything you guys saw was Sri Lanka. There was not any. Um, whatever and so it's just anyway thanks everybody uh, and, and that, that's all i have thank you very much steve uh very a, a bit of an eye-opener for me personally as well and a very interesting perspective I can't hear you. let me do something i'll stop share maybe yeah can you hear me now all right yeah so i just wanted to thank you steve once again i can't hear you john Oh, uh, let me try this. Can you hear me now? Steve, can you hear me? I can't hear anything. Can you guys hear me? Yes, we can hear you. You can hear me. I can't hear you. Oh. Hang on. I don't know what's going on here. We had no idea. I don't know what happened. Oh, wait, let me try this. Oh, maybe I muted it. Can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Can you hear us? Oh, that's better. Yeah, yeah I can hear you now. I, I, I muted the video. That's what happened. Okay. 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 I hear well, you. Well, I just wanted to say thank you very much. Bit of an eye opener. Definitely a very interesting perspective from the work you've done. Um, honestly, given the extent to which the captive elephant industry in Sri Lanka needs to be reformed. I think the work that you've done is one critical step in taking that forward. And I look forward to seeing how that work can be applied potentially to Sri Lanka in the future as well. So thank you very much for your time, Steve. Thanks for having me. Uh, and lastly, uh, for this evening, I would like to invite Dr. Dabere um, to give us a bit of a legislative and regulatory context, as well as potentially uh, an update on the prevailing court case that was filed against the regulations promulgated under the Foreign Fauna Protection Ordinance. Uh, Dr. Dabre, over to you. You have uh, 10 to 15 minutes allocated. Thank you. Thank you very much uh, for the opportunity afforded to me to uh, speak uh, on behalf of, uh, uh, actually on behalf of uh, uh, lawyers and various other uh, parties involved in uh, protection of animals, <clears throat> and especially on behalf of the Center for Environmental Justice, uh, who is a pioneering organization uh, uh, working along with uh, Panchali and various other uh, professionals in environmental uh, and elephant protection and animal protection. Actually, uh, being a lawyer or attorney at law, I think uh, it, it uh, sh should be my duty to uh, touch the legal uh, uh, instrument or legal scope 
that has been uh, there in the country for the protection of elephants. Actually, colonial rulers, uh, they should be given due regard and appreciation for preparing laws uh, to protect animals, including elephants. Uh, in 1872, they promulgated the ordinance to prevent uh, wasteful destruction of buffaloes and game, uh, game throughout the island. That was the uh, first uh, piece of legislation that uh, we can uh, uh, identify uh, introduced in Sri Lanka for the protection of uh, elephants and other animals. But uh, the word elephant uh, is not uh, particularly used in that particular order or, or the piece of legislation. Uh, and in 1889, Colonel uh, Clark, acting conservator general, uh, conservator general of Forest, also prepared a report pointing out the uh, destruction uh, or disasters, uh, actually disastrous uh, effects of commercial exploitation of the wildlife, and it paved the way for the emergence of the ordinance to pre prevent wanton destruction of elephants, buffaloes, and other game. That was the next uh, step. And uh, in 1999, game protection ordinance was passed and uh, introduced. After that, existing uh, fauna and flora protection ordinance number two of 1937 was introduced. Uh, that is the law that is uh, in existing in the country at the moment. But uh, although it was originally introduced in uh, 1937, later in 2009, uh, it uh, was subjected to a uh, major amendment or major overhaul. And <clears throat> after that, uh, uh, now we can discuss the existing law. And e even after the uh, e even after the introduction of uh, this 1937 uh, piece of legislation, before the 2009 uh, amendment is brought in, uh, we uh, sign uh, CITES uh, agreement that is also now considered as uh, part of the country because uh, once uh, now according to the law of the country once an agreement is signed it is treated as the uh, a soft law it is treated as a soft law of this country the site is we all know the convention on international trade in endangered uh, species of wild uh, fauna and flora uh, actually that uh, piece of uh, that convention was ratified in sri lanka by sri lanka in 1979 although uh, uh, the actually uh, this particular uh, convention was emerged in 1975. We ratified it after four years. Now, uh, uh, I, I told you that uh, major amendments uh, to the fauna and flora protection ordinance brought in uh, uh, by Act Number uh, 22 of 2009. As at today, uh, we look at the fauna and flora protection ordinance. There is a separate uh, section or separate part. We know, uh, usually call it as the part two of the ordinance to deal with the uh, protection of the elephant. And uh, especially, <clears throat> uh, we would like. I would like to emphasize uh, on the. Uh, long title of the fauna and flora protection ordinance it says an ordinance to provide for the protection and conservation of the fauna and flora of sri lanka and their habitats for the prevention of commercial and other misuse emphasize said it actually i want i i want to emphasize that particular uh, that particular sentence for the prevention of commercial and other misuse of such fauna and flora and their habitats, because this uh, that is the main one of the main purpose of introducing this particular piece of legislation. As I told you earlier, part two uh, it uh, start from section twelve of the fauna and flora protection ordinance and goes on to section thirty of the fauna and flora protection ordinance. All large number of sections have already been allotted by the legislature for the protection of elephants. Even uh, how uh, uh, the elephant can be captured is uh, described under section 13. And uh, uh, likewise, uh, 
section uh, 19 a prohibition of export of any part of any, uh, uh, any part of an elephant uh, then uh, section 20 offenses of elephant and uh, the most important uh, uh, the section is section 22 a it deals with the registration and licensing of elephants because now in sri lanka uh, there are a lot of court cases and the most of the recent court cases are with regard to the uh, irregularities that has taken place in registration and licensing of elephants section 22a of the fauna and flora protection ordinance is the section which deals with the registration and license licensing actually in order to possess an elephant a person who possesses that elephant requires these two documents merely having one document is not sufficient one is a registration valid registration second one is the valid license this is uh, something similar to uh, uh, vehicle owners uh, documents there is a uh, book of that particular vehicle that is registration book and the person who uh, drives that particular ve vehicle should have a license and in addition to that that particular vehicle also should have a revenue license and various other type of license other than the in addition to the registration book likewise even uh, uh, for an elephant to possess an elephant by a private party other than the state he should possess a, a, a registration as well as a license that is the legal requirement which is very clearly stated under section 22a of the fauna and flora protection ordinance then the uh, section 22a subsection 6 describe how you can become an owner of an elephant the first method is by sale you can become an owner or by gift you can become an owner uh, by death of the previous owner you can become an owner of an elephant and other legal men the from time to time law provides how you can become an owner of elephant but for that even to uh, even for the owner registration and uh, license is very important those are must and especially when the ownership is changed that is the most important thing when the ownership is changed you have to obtain a fresh registration as well as a fresh license that is the law and <clears throat> even in uh, pregnancy but we, we have uh, witnessed only two, as I can remember, pregnancies uh, uh, within the captive elephants. Uh, if there is any uh, pregnancy, it is the duty of the owner to inform the pregnancy to the director general. And uh, even at the birth, it is the duty of the uh, owner to inform about that birth within seven days of the occurrence of any such event may be birth, birth uh, includes uh, stillbirth uh, also, right? That, uh, that is another duty uh, casted on the owner, that is section 22, capital A, subsection 10. And even uh, if there is any death at the time of the birth, that has to be informed to the uh, director general before remains are destroyed. And, uh, the most uh, attractive piece of legislation is if any elephant which has, which has not been registered under the, this section shall be presumed to be taken or removed from the wild without lawful authority or approved and such elephant shall be deemed to be a public property. Now, when there is a public property, the law applicable is the provisions of offenses against the Public Property Act, 
which is very tough and even uh, obtaining bail is very uh, difficult from lower courts now when the law is uh, when uh, this is the law right uh, uh, there is a important regulation formulated while the uh, law is in place in 1991 for the registration of elephant and tuskers that is uh, known as the regulations may be cited as Regu registration and licensing of tuskers and elephants regulations 1991 this regulation was properly passed in the parliament it says uh, it the, that that regulation uh, the gazette itself says that is approved by the parliament but subsequently uh, they uh, some people those who are interested in uh, uh, circumvent or those those who are, those who are interested in uh, challenging the validity of this particular gazette notification somehow or the other tried that this particular uh, gazette notification has not been properly passed in the parliament right but that is not so because that this gazette itself says that is that has been properly approved by the parliament the important uh, features of this uh, registration gazette there is a separate format for the application for registration registration application there is a separate format in the gazette that particular in that particular format even a photograph has to be pasted even there is another format for the application of license registration is a separate thing license is a separate thing and even the at the time of issuance there is a format of issuance the certificate of registration as well as the there is a format of the license to be issued by the uh, department of wildlife in addition to that under this 1991 regulations you get a uh, format of a register to be maintained by the director under the section 22 a of the fauna and flora protection ordinance because he has to maintain a registration of elephant and tuskers under this particular uh, regulation gazetted in 2000, uh, 1991 but in lot of people those who captured elephant illegally they could not follow the or they could not uh, follow the procedures or there is no way of following the procedures that are laid down in this particular gazette that is why later there were some efforts to challenge the validity of this gazette state in that uh, illegally or fraudulently stating that this gazette has not been properly passed in the parliament and in addition to that in addition to challenging the validity of this this gazette uh, to uh, legalize their illegally captured elephants they were trying to introduce new gazette notification uh, in 2021 so at the time of this uh, new gazette notification bari number 2241 stroke 41 dated 19 august uh, 2021 was issued there were number of cases against the illegally captured uh, elephant owners in the magistrate court now they found that they cannot win the case and they will be ultimately uh, found guilty for capturing elephants so as uh, explained by the previous speakers even by uh, panchali one such elephant was possessed by or owned by the former president nanda sena gotabe rajapaksha even the former president's uh, uh, secu uh, security officer uh, the uh, and former prime minister security officer Uh, also possessed two elephants and uh, some of the chief incumbents also uh, were the owners of the elephants therefore they had uh, pressurized the government uh, to somehow the <coughs> uh, rescue them from being uh, 
even some judges or the magistrate were also accused of having uh, illegally captured elephants so uh, the government uh, attempted to uh, rescue them by introducing this new piece of uh, legislation which is known as the uh, 2021 gazette actually this gazette of course is a gross violation of the existing existing provis uh, provisions of the fauna and flora protection ordinance and the especially the uh, long title also is violated by this particular gazette notification even <clears throat> this gazette notification uh, describe about using minimum force without define what is the minimum force uh, and paving way for the uh, cruelty being inserted on the uh, or afflicted on the elephants and even uh, it says uh, it provides or there are provisions to use the elephants in tourism industry uh, and uh, especially uh, uh, elephant rights are also permitted which is not found in the former regulations which they are going to uh, or attempting to uh, annul with the introduction of the new regulation even uh, they are introducing traditional doctors to uh, who can take decisions with regard to the elephants but they are not defining the government is not defining who a traditional doctor is or what who or what uh, actually the there, there is no definition uh, for, uh, as to the qualifications what should be possessed by this particular traditional doctor and even the new regulations pave the way to uh, commercial utilization of elephants even uh, transportation of timber and other weight is also legalized uh, by this newly introduced gasset notification and even the elephants uh, are uh, permitted to utilized in commercial activities during their uh, yes uh, the following animals shall not be engaged in any work uh, during their <clears throat> must period actually the must period is the period where elephants are not uh, has to be very carefully looked after uh, because their behavior is unpredictable uh, i think the, those uh, details were explained in uh, explained by future uh, for, uh, former speakers and even uh, they are introducing registered uh, sorry tamed elephant owners organization also uh, and they are they are uh, the new uh, regulation intends to get the authorization of releasing uh, authorization of this tamed elephant owners organization at the time of releasing or handing over the elephant to uh, viharadhipati and various other uh, organizations because of the vested interest this should not be done that is one of the main arguments of the parties those who are against acting against this uh, uh, publication of, of gasset notification anyway uh, actually we went to the courts uh, even with panchali and the center for environmental justice hemant dilena we all went to the courts uh, uh, with along with some other petitioners uh, to challenge this gasset notification and somehow or the other we were able to temporarily sus uh, suspend the Uh, registration of elephants under the, uh, under this particular gazette notification issued in 2021 until such time the case is concluded or argued even uh, <clears throat> the regularize uh, the part 2 the obtaining at the time of obtaining a license uh, under the new gazette notification they are not inquiring from where these elephants are obtained that says uh, that 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 particular law permits 
every person who in, intends to register and obtain a license for a tame elephant should obtain a license from the prescribed officer if i can have a tele, uh, elephant i have an elephant and i if, if i can declare this as a tame elephant that is the only requirement no previous license no previous registration uh, even the way how he received that particular elephant is also not fiction under new regulations this is clearly paving the way for the registration of illegally captured elephants because uh, we know that when illegal ca captured elephants are concerned they don't have previous uh, details of pre previous owners and the, even the parties those who are uh, those who have the position they are not in a position to divulge from where these elephants were received and captured because there is no legal uh, capture of elephants with regard to these uh, uh, parties those parties those who are uh, already uh, those uh, the cases are also uh, against whom cases are all, already instituted even uh, <clears throat> Uh, that is, uh, even uh, any person having the ownership of an elephant by a license, son or so other legal document or by other succession, can uh, uh, they are permitted to register elephants. But mm, the son or so is not a legally accepted method of passing the ownership of an elephant. There is no law, even the, there is a letter issued by the Honorable Attorney General the elephants cannot be bequeathed. The ownership or the possession of the elephant cannot be bequeathed through, an son, through a son. Sir. But uh, the former president, uh, Mr. Gotabe Rajapaksa, has received that elephant uh, through a son, sir, which is totally illegal and there is no way. Even this particular gazette notification legalized son, sir, the donating of or uh, bequeath in the possession of. Uh, Elephants to Sanna, sir, which is contrary to the main act, Fauna and Flora Protection Ordinance, because when normally the law is when the gazette is issued under a, under a main law, the gazette has to be in comply. Gazette has to be, uh, gazette has to comply with the provisions of the main act. If the, if the gazette is not complying with the provisions of the main net, that gazette is not valid. That gazette cannot exist. Even, even with regard to this particular gazette, we are, we are pointed, pointing out hundreds of irregularities and Ill illegalities of this particular gazette and uh, arguing that this gazette is contrary to the uh, main act, that's main fauna and flora protection ordinance. Even Succession is considered as a qualification to grant the registration and the license. So this, uh, if this uh, particular gazette is permitted to operate instead of, instead of form a gazette, 1991 gazette, it will definitely pave the way for the uh, registration of illegally captured telephones. That is how they tried to legalize the illegally captured elephants and do away with the existing court cases. That is, that is the, how they attempted. Now oh. we, are, we are trying to, hello? We, through the court cases, we have uh, challenged this particular gazette notification and uh, we are trying to uh, Cost the validity of this uh, subsequent document, and we want the 1991 regulations to be in force. And <clears throat> uh, even uh, cultural purposes and uh, religious purposes, obtaining uh, there are provisions uh, of obtaining tame uh, the, the elephants and the tuskers. That is also through the intervention of the tame elephant owners organization, which is not uh, permit uh, not uh, per, uh, uh, should not be allowed that should not be permitted because they are a group who are having a vested interest and uh, there is no 
uh, legal authority for them to be a part of uh, decision making with regard to the elephants because under the fauna and flora protection ordinance they don't have any say those parties those who are uh, named in this particular gazette they don't have any right to inter intervene or interfere with the decision making process of uh, bequeathing elephants and even the director general of uh, wildlife he has also very limited powers to bequeath elephants uh, under very limited circumstances uh, but not as uh, described in this particular gazette notification which they are going to uh, implement or which they have which they have already published even uh, uh, there are a lot of uh, irregularities uh, even uh, with the newly formed gazettes and uh, even uh, the goad is the sharp uh, sharp goad is also introduced which uh, is capable of uh, injuring the elephant all those things are aimed at uh, obtaining the legality for the illegally captured elephant and uh, permitting the commercial use and the abuse of uh, commercial use of the elephant and permitting uh, inflicting harm on the elephant and uh, uh, creating a uh, unwanted room and paving an unwanted room for the uh, capturing of elephant to the wild uh thank you very much for the opportunity afforded to me to make uh, this speech thank you very much dr dabre a vital update on the um court case challenging the potential legalization of the new regulations promulgated under the bffpo and also an interesting history into the legal and regulatory components of uh wild elephant conservation and attitudes towards captive element conservation in Sri Lanka as well. So thank you very much. Uh, before we wrap up, Panchali, any last words from you before I wrap up? Um, thank you. Uh, thank you very much, everyone. Um, I think now uh, I have to say a few words about Muthuraja because uh, every, a lot of people have been asking about what is, what is happening. Well, um, for one and a half years, we tried very hard not just us, even there were, uh, there were even captive elephant supporters were trying very hard to, uh, uh, to like to get some sort of help from him. And because of these legal loopholes, the Department of Wildlife Conservation did not uh, take any responsibility or they, they did not want to help. So um, as an organization, we had to write to the Thai government and we are very thankful to the um, Thai government for um, for um, uh, yeah um, John I think you had to stop share okay right sorry so we are very thankful to the uh, Thai government for the help they sent they um, they uh, they brought down they brought down uh, five vests from Thailand and they checked on him and finally they worked with the Sri Lankan uh, Foreign Ministry. And uh, the Thai government has taken Muthuraja into their custody, and he is placed in Dehivala Zoological Gardens. Um, from uh, from the discussions that we had with the Thai embassy, we understand that they want to take Muthuraja back to Thailand. Now, um, as uh, I think, as we discussed, there are two ways that elephants can be kept. You can either uh, use negative reinforcement and keep elephants, or you can use positive reinforcement and keep elephants. Muthuraja, unfortunately, cannot go back to the wild again. So he has to stay in captivity in a retired state. So um, now in Sri Lanka, of course, Pinnavala is not a suitable place. Dehivala is not a suitable place. Pritiyagama Safari Park, although has some problems and issues, they are, I mean, they don't keep elephants in uh, in concrete. Uh, they keep them on natural ground and they keep them on long chains. Uh, as uh, Steve showed you about that uh, elephant that was uh, 
enjoying uh, his freedom uh, in Sri Lanka. So we can uh, keep Mithuraja uh, as it is in Rivyakama in that condition and or and as a, an as animal as an animal welfare community and as an as an animal loving community we could actually contribute and build a strong fence for him in Rivyagama and then he doesn't even have to be in one chain he can be chain free and we can of course like 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 the speakers here we could uh, get uh, expertise advice and train the Mahmuds in Rivigam Safari Park on positive reinforcement and keep keep Mutharaja there. So that is the option right now that we are advocating for because Mutharaja has suffered so much and even a trip on a plane is a lot of trauma for an elephant. It's not uh, it's not something uh, very pleasant for an elephant. I mean, if yeah, so there are very good private places in Thailand. There are sanctuaries that are uh, certified by World Animal Protection as ethical sanctuaries, where they give a lot of space for elephants. They have, uh, they, uh, they, they definitely follow uh, positive reinforcement, and the elephants are chain free. If Muthuraja can be taken to a sanctuary like that, that's the best solution. But if, but, uh, but the government places in Thailand. Uh, okay, let's say they are better than say some place like uh, Thai Elephant Conservation Center is definitely better than the temple, maybe better than the Himala Zoo or Pinavala, but we, we can't really say that it is better than Rivyakama. Maybe they're all like the, the same uh, caliber. It's not a really bad place because TECC has different sections. So maybe, you know, there are sections that we can't agree on in like training elephants and breeding elephants and so on, but they have one of the best hospitals in the world or the best hospital in the world for elephants, uh, especially for captive elephants, because there are like around um, 3,800 captive elephants in Thailand. So, um, so their expertise is really good and definitely Thuraja is not going to be used for any work or he will be retiring in TCC even if he goes there. Um, but that's not like the perfect solution for him. So, which is why if, if I mean, if he has to take a plane trip and go to an ethical sanctuary, we 100% support that. We would support that. But, uh, but we don't want him to take that plane trip just to go and stay in another negatively reinforcement uh, place like TECC. That's the problem there. But it's not that Pinavala, Dehivala, or the temple is uh, better than that. No, definitely TECC is better than that. But then we can give a similar uh, situation even as it is at Ridhyagama. So, so that is the condition right now. We are trying very hard to either keep him in Radhigam Safari Park or uh, to send him to a sanctuary in Thailand. But the elephant is now in the custody of the Thai embassy, as in uh, in legal custody. It's their elephant. He is just kept in the Hivala, Safar, the Hivala Zoo. So, um, you know, it's, 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 it's another uphill climb. I mean, I think, yeah, the most difficult thing was taking, out, taking him out of the temple, but this is also going to be as equally hard to now convince uh, the Thai government as well. So whatever uh, our, our listeners can do to help, please uh, try. We are also trying. Let's see what, can, what we can do. So this is the present status of Mutharaja. And thank you very much, everyone, um, for, uh, for uh, giving a voice to the captive elephants of Sri Lanka, because I know what a challenge it is, um, how difficult it is to actually come out and talk about it, because a lot of people are very scared uh, to talk about a temple or you know, like actually come and talk the facts. So I'm very, it is much appreciated. Thank you so much. And let's do this again some time later as well. And let's continue the fight because we all have equal rights. You know, we don't have any any um, any larger or superior right than elephants. Elephants and us are all equal, uh, just like any other sentient being. So let's just. Uh, fight for our right and continue the fight. Thank you very much. Thank you, Panchali. Very critical updates coming on Mutaraja. And I know for a fact that the team will continue to work on this and further updates will be provided in the future.
Let me just give one more very quick round of thanks to all the panelists who came and who devoted their valuable time today. So thank you again, Panchali. Thank you to Sangeeta, Steve, Otara, uh, Dr. Dabre, who's still with us, and to Rukshan as well, who's still with us. This fight, as Panchali said, is a long drawn out one. And as we've heard, it's been going on for many decades, but it will continue well into the future until we achieve some form of equity and equality for all captive animals, as well as ensuring that our biodiversity survives into the future. Thank you very much once again, everyone, and good night. Thank you. Good night.